Thank you and welcome. Uh, I'm Carol Scott, I'm the chair of ICOM UK and I'm going to be the compare for our conference today and my colleague um, Katie Charles from NMDC, NMDC and ICOM UK are partners in this project and have been since 2013. Um, I must say after all our meticulous planning and we've been planning since June last year, the one thing that we couldn't plan was the weather. So it's uh, terrific to see so many of you, you know, here and, and on time this morning. We thought we might have a bit more of a problem than we did. Um, it's my very great pleasure to really start the proceedings with thank yous on behalf of the organizing committee. And the first people I would like to thank are Nick Merriman, director of Manchester Museum, and Maria Belshaw, director of the Whitworth, uh, for providing us with this absolutely wonderful venue for the conference today. We're really very appreciative and very grateful. And our thanks also go to Kelly Jones, who has been our, um, our on-site coordinator, you know, and just a terrific person to work with and very efficient. And the coordination of this event today is you know, largely down to Kelly and her efforts on all our behalf. And thank you, too, to all of the speakers who accepted our invitation to be part of this program. Um, I think you know, we, you've enabled us to put together an event which I think you're going to find interesting and uh, inspiring and really quite compelling and really offering different ways of thinking about international work. I, I also get the job of um, the housekeeping issues, so I'll, I'll get those out of the way now and then we can get on to some of the other things. In the unlikely event of uh, an alarm, meaning that we have to evacuate, we are supposed to take, you know, sort of be, take the doors behind us, go downstairs and go out the front door and convene sort of in front of the museum. Um, if the toilets are needed, they're on the lower ground floor. There's a lift just to the right out of the same doors. You go down to the lower ground floor and then turn to your right. Um, we, we know that one of the really important things about a conference like this is not just the information that um, we get, it's also the opportunities for networking. So we've allowed um, a whole um, an hour for lunch and we also have a participatory session this afternoon. And finally, at the end of the day, uh, Maria is providing tours around the, the Whitworth and so that's an opportunity to see a terrific collection in a really marvelous new architectural space. British museums are no strangers to working internationally. I'd have to say that British museums are outward facing, receptive to new ideas. The collections are world renowned. Um, the profession really has a reputation for best practice and the expertise of museum professionals from Britain is in great demand. But um, economically, these are very hard times. And when we got together last June and started thinking about planning this conference, that was the issue, the issue we really wanted to address, was working internationally in hard times. And since June, of course, the Comprehensive Spending Review has come down, and I guess the best news from that is at least stabilized funding for some period of time for the national museums. But for regional and civic museums that are dependent on local government funding, um, the prospects are not as optimistic, and in fact, they're, they're really working within a declining resource base. And as a result of that, I mean, in that context, I think to work internationally, we have to um, work smart and um, be resilient and look at partnerships. And so I think really one of the big themes of today is international partnerships and how they can work for us. And I think when we work with international partners, we have an opportunity to really widen the scope, um, tip into a, a, a wider pool of creative ideas, have access to other funding sources, spread the risk, and also you know, move a little bit beyond the traditional ways of international work to really build projects that have longer term social value. So these are some of the underlying threads to the program today. We're looking for the opportunities and the partnerships that allow us to innovate and work smart for longer term value. Um, I, I suppose I should say that it's fitting that working internationally itself is also a partnership. And I've already mentioned NMDC and ICOM UK. Every year there's a different venue partner. And this year our venue partner has been Manchester Museums and Galleries Partnership. 
Next year, our partner will be the Natural History Museum, and so we will be meeting on the 2nd of March, 2017, at the Natural History Museum. So save the date and put that in your diary now. We look forward to seeing many of you there. Um, in addition to um, Katie and Nick Merriman and Kelly Jones, who've been on the organizing committee, there are some other people who've put a lot of time and effort um, and creative energy into this project. And one is um, Jane Weeks from the British Council. Another is Janet Barnes, who hosted us at York Museums Trust for Working Internationally 2015. And the third one is Donna Andrew, who is the coordinator of the Working Internationally Regional Project. And many of you will have met Donna at workshops around the country. But it was Katie who really suggested to us that we could um, start from another end when we were thinking about this program. And instead of thinking about the activities that people do, we could think about the outcomes that they create. And so it was really her suggestion about thinking about the, the social value that can be created from international work in terms of knowledge and health and well-being and placemaking and building local capacity. So I'd like Katie to elaborate a bit on those themes now. Thank you, Carol. Um, yes, as Carol said, and it's difficult to imagine June um, sitting watching the snow, um, but we started planning the conference when um, at the same time at NMDC we were also thinking about um, a, a kind of advocacy and, and looking at where museums contributed to um, what we would call kind of public policy priorities. So those, those big concerns that um, so civil society, the concerns and challenges civil society needs to meet. Um, in the, the, the work we did, in the end, we identified eight. Don't worry, we're not going to go through all of them. Um, but there are, there are four that are particularly pertinent to international work. Um, our communities are more diverse um, than ever. Uh, social media and, and online means that inevitably any museum with a, a social media account or with a website does to some extent have international relationships. You, your collection are available to people um, who may not cross the threshold of your museum and they um, engage with your, with your collections and the expertise of your staff. Um, so that's international and we in, the, our collections in the UK are, are, have always told world stories and the way the collections came together um, is in itself a, a kind of story of the world. So they've always tried to place the UK's position um, in the wider world and try to, for the visitors, um, remain relevant to what's going on um, in contemporary uh, news and current affairs. So the four that we, that we picked out to explore um, is uh, knowledge and innovation. So how do museums contribute to research and scientific endeavour, to technological change, to the way in which museum collections can inspire innovation and creativity? And so um, we're very grateful to have Paul Smith from University of Oxford Museums to talk a little bit about knowledge exchange partnerships. Um, something that we will all hear a great deal more of when the uh, government publishes its white paper, culture white paper is about placemaking and culture's role in making a place an attractive to live in, to work in and to visit. Um, and as I mentioned about, about communities, about kind of globalisation, Inevitably, places, it's about looking at places in their international context as much as their, as their local. Um, so we looked at how, how you can foster a sense of local identity and, um, and a sense of pride in peaceful and prosperous communities. And today we've got Sheffield and uh, Mosey looking at how these two great northern cities um, can have citywide initiatives um, that place those in the context of the wider world. Um, we're going to look at health and well-being. Museums' contribution to health and well-being was covered here in a conference yesterday. Um, has been well documented. Do wonderful things about to, to help people feel less isolated and and to live a, to kind of make them feel better in some ways. Um, and it's not a UK-specific phenomenon or a UK-specific problem. So why not share our knowledge and our expertise um, and learn from colleagues overseas as well as in the UK? And lastly, we're going to look, uh, obviously, at culture and, uh, and the kind of cultural culture's uh, ability to be able to maintain 
partnerships and uh, relationships where those political contexts may be a little bit more strained. Um, the, that mutual interest in collections and the expertise uh, is a long-term way of building relationships and, uh, and is able to, to be maintained even when the, the, the prevailing politics is a little bit more rocky um, and, and unusual. It's the culture that allows us to explore, allows audiences to explore the world without a kind of a fettered political message. Um, and the two projects that we're going to look at, uh, Manchester's Manchester Museum's relationships around the world and also Cosmonauts at the Science Museum are two excellent examples of, of where culture has helped maintain those sorts of conversations. Now, when we were thinking of a, a keynote speaker um, for, this, for this conference, we felt that we couldn't go further or better than Dr. Maria Belshock, the director of the Whitworth, and we were very, very pleased when she accepted our invitation. I think one of the things about this conference that we've really always tried right from the beginning is that we try to think outside the box to sort of look at really innovative ways to use collections. And Maria has a lot to share with us about what the Whitworth and, um, and Manchester Gallery have been doing. But also, you know, besides the benefits, there are challenges. Beside the planned outcomes, there are all those un unanticipated outcomes. An academic by training, Maria has worked as director within the cultural sector for the past 10 years. And alongside her role as director of Manchester City Gallery and the Whitworth, she's recently taken on the role of director of culture for Manchester Council. She's a board member of Arts Council England, and she was awarded a CBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours for Services to the Arts in June 2015. Please welcome Maria Belshaw. So I'm going to kick off this morning's conference by talking you through uh, what is really 10 years of international working here at the Whitworth and at Manchester Art Gallery. And it, it's not so much a story of what I did on my work-based holidays, um, but much more the story of our developing thinking here in Manchester about the kinds of international work that we can do, the work that we ought to be doing in terms of both our collections um, and also the communities and audiences that we find in this city. But it's also about sharing how our ambitions around international working and international partnerships have actually driven our strategic ambitions, not just for the institutions, but also for the city. Um, and as I go through a number of examples, I'll be pointing out um, the reasons for doing this kind of work, um, and some suggestions around why we found it so useful. But I also will be sharing lessons learned because God knows we have learned some over the past decade. So I wanted to start with um, a recollection of a moment. In 2013, on July the 1st, at 4.35 in the morning, I was in the Whitworth. I would like to say I'm not usually at work that early. I was in the foyer, um, the, the circular entrance to the, the original Whitworth building, along with a group of journalists, some extremely intrepid and hardy local visitors, and the artist Nikhil Chopra um, from Mumbai, now based in Goa. Nikhil, um, unlike the rest of us, was asleep in the middle of the space, or at least apparently so, on a very, very large bale of cotton material. As sun rose, he woke up. He was dressed as an Indian labourer, a cotton worker, and he proceeded to wake himself, unroll what turned out to be this piece of canvas, and pulled it had no drawing on it at that stage, pulled it through the length of the gallery spaces at the Whitworth into the corridor that now takes you down to the landscape gallery, but which then was a, an unfinished concrete corridor that led you to the new wing of the Whitworth, which at that stage had a floor, sides, and no roof. Into that space, he pulled out this very large tent, which he had designed to be rigged to the walls and pulled by ropes, by him, um, to create a tented environment in our half-finished 
new building. And he lived in that space for 60 hours. He performed a series of identities. He morphed from cotton worker to recognizably Mancunian cotton laborer to eventually the overseer of a cotton mill. During the 60 hours, which ran continuously through day and night, he drew on the wall of his tent. Um, he created a landscape drawing in charcoal that took you from the 19th century textile districts of Manchester to the 20th century districts for textiles in Mumbai. And during that period, 11,500 people came and spent time with him in this space. We were very lucky, and it didn't rain. Uh, instead, the weather turned on a kind of um, go and turn and was roughly 28 degrees for the whole of the 60 hours. The tent had been made in Goa and sent to us by a DHL. It was imbued with the, the scent of the market in Mapsa where it had been made. So 11,500 people who were Mancunians or visitors coming to the International Festival, because this was part of um, the whole of the Manchester International Festival, they sat in the tent, they smelt a bit of Goa, and they saw something unfold that was about the international connections between Manchester and the Indian subcontinent. Something that was about Manchester's history, but also the history of the world. And they, they witnessed the creation of a kind of international space for encounter. It was completely extraordinary and attracted for us not just about four times more visitors than we had imagined, but also completely different kinds of audiences that ran from our local Indian and Pakistani community that live on our doorstep to a slightly raucous and um, drunk audience at two o'clock in the morning who were getting on buses from the festival square right in the center of, of um, Manchester and coming down the Oxford Road to spend some time with a sleeping artist in the middle of the night. So I wanted to start with that because it is honestly one of the high points of my professional career here at the Whitworth. And we couldn't have created something like that as part of the International Festival were it not for a much longer term, really complex set of relationships and network building that was really about exploring the possibilities of international working for us. But it didn't start at that kind of ambitious level. So I wanted to start here with a picture of one of the lovely watercolours in the Whitworth collection, whose power, of course, shouldn't be underestimated. Like for many of you, I imagine, our thinking about international working began with, I wonder if we could tour some of our exhibitions. Now, over the last 20 years, on occasion, both Manchester uh, Gallery and the Whitworth have taken individual exhibitions and sent them to international partners. We've done it in North America, we had done it in South Korea, we've done it in Japan. These watercolours, quite a large selection of them, went on a five-city tour of Japan in the year where we were beginning to close the Whitworth for renovation. So we could afford to let the best of our watercolours um, go on their holidays to Japan because we knew we weren't going to be showing them here. And in fact, given that we were doing major work across the whole building, I was quite relieved to have some of the highly valuable turners out of the building and not in our slightly precarious stores at that stage. So this is an example of a relatively straightforward international partnership that raised the profile of the Whitworth's collection and the city of Manchester at a period where we very much wanted to do that as we were developing and expanding the gallery. It wasn't complicated to do 
because it was supported by the exhibition's touring division of Asai Shimbun, who some of you will have worked with, the British Museum worked with very, very extensively. And they are super good at touring exhibitions, and they sourced the individual museums that wanted to take our collection. The reason it worked so well is because there was a very strong wish to see 18th and 19th century British watercolours in Japan. This kind of huge um, relationship between Japanese landscape tradition and British landscape tradition. These kinds of works only get seen very rarely in Japan. So there was need on one side and a desire to send them on the other. And for that reason, it became a strategic priority for us. It also ended up earning us £120,000, which funded some other projects we needed to happen here. But I would say that that kind of earning potential, which is very often what has driven thinking about how can we work internationally, um, is, that's very rare. This is the only example I can share with you where any of our international working has earned us anything at all. And it is really because it was straightforward. Most of these drawings and watercolours are quite small, um, not that complicated to send. Um, and so we had a, n a knowing and willing set of partners um, in Japan meeting um, a kind of known quantity in terms of looking after these and sending these kinds of works abroad on our side. The Japanese partners made a much more beautiful book than we ever would have been able to do. Um, in both languages, because that was something they really wanted. And I had an incredibly proud couple of days riding around the metro in Tokyo, seeing posters of the Whitworth watercolours wherever I went. It was really very good in terms of international profile raising. But, and this is important to me in terms of social impact, this is a first world to first world partnership. You know, Japanese museums and galleries broadly operate in exactly the same way we do here in the UK. And it is straightforward um, in, in, in most terms to do this kind of work. And, and it isn't something that meets the kinds of social ambitions we have in terms of audience reach and sharing our collection that, that drive the core of our work. It's not to underestimate um, its earning potential or its value, but it is um, sort of within our comfort zone, very much. Everything else I'm going to talk about, definitely outside our comfort zone. So the next point on our journey was just a tiny bit more ambitious. We made a show here called Blake's Shadow which was a partnership with academics on campus. Uh, it looked at Blake's influence right the way through to um, contemporary music. You know, Blake influencing The Doors, Jar Wobble, uh, Julian Cope. Um, great exhibition, quite ambitious intellectual content. There, we built a relationship with the University Art Gallery in South Korea, which our university already had a good partnership with they were really comfortable with both familiar looking Blake images and weird jar wobble music. And not all international partners would have been interested in that kind of intellectual journey. But for me, this is a, was a good next step because it was about building on the kind of international partnerships that exist, slightly unusually, within our academic context. And I got strong support from the University of Manchester who were keen to see much closer intellectual links between the two institutions. So the kind of the first step on from straightforward exhibition touring for me was there is a, an intellectual and strategic advantage to taking this work out to South Korea. Good professional development for my staff as well, who did a series of talks as well as exhibition installation out in South Korea. The next step was much more ambitious and came out of our partnership with the International Festival. Operating within Manchester, MIF, as it is known, um, prides itself on 
building international partnerships and commissioning original work that you would not see anywhere else in the world and then sending that out around the world after its um, first showing here in Manchester. So this image is Nikhil Chopra, who you saw at the beginning, in his first project with us. He was one of 14 artists selected by Marina Abramovich, myself, and Hans Ulrich Obrist, um, who took over all of the exhibition spaces at the Whitworth to do an 18-day long performance marathon. Um, they performed four hours a day, every day of the festival, to a captive audience who had to arrive on time, don a, um, a lab coat, and enter into a live art experiment with Marina Abramovich. She, as the kind of curator, artist lead of this project, kick-started a process of stepping up our ambition here at the Whitworth by sitting down at the beginning of the project and asking me if I would remove the entire collection from the building so that the 14 artists could have a room each to do whatever they wanted. And I found out later in the project that she'd only asked for the entire building as a kind of starter for 10, assuming that I would say, no, you can have one space, and that we'd meet in the middle with maybe four or five galleries. But we were at the beginning of a journey at the Whitworth where we really wanted to raise our game, both in terms of artistic ambition and international partnerships. So it seemed wise to me to say yes straight away to her so that we could see if we could do it. And because of the marvellous conservators and curators here at the gallery, it turned out we did have enough room in the stores for the entire collection. And actually, clearing out the entire building um, cleared our heads a bit in terms of thinking about how we could work differently. So Nick Hill ends up in one of the middle spaces and he starts to make a work which is about the legacy of the British Raj, traditions of British landscape painting um, in India, history of his grandfather, Queen Victoria, uh, as you can see, bits of Gandhi, and history of hope, use of homespun, charcoal, and scribbling all over our walls, which did manage to spread charcoal just through virtually the whole building, which was a little bit stressful for the conservators. But what came out of giving Nikhil the space here was a completely reconceived approach to our collection as well as to our international working. So Nikhil created landscape drawings that looked very reminiscent of our collection here, all over the walls, and then scribbled all over them. So they appeared and disappeared during the course of the performance. He eventually dressed as Queen Victoria, exited the building and walked all the way down the Oxford Road, which was quite a thing to behold. Um, and then, when the performance marathon had finished, he had worked with curators here to select some works from the landscape collection that then hung on these charcoal-covered walls. So he set up within the space that he'd been given a new relationship between our British collection and our imperial history and the Indian subcontinent. Now, during the course of this performance period, um, it would be fair to say we started to see a new audience here at the Whitworth. Alex Poots, the director of MIF, and I had programmed this project knowing or feeling that it would be a niche thing. And we didn't mind that, it was free. We decided we didn't really care if only 50 or 60 people came at a time, that it was going to be the kind of loss leader for the festival, a thing that took a risk, and it didn't matter if it didn't kind of um, have a huge impact on people which was kind of lesson number one, never underestimate what visitors and audiences want. Because this sold out for all 18 days of the festival. We had people standing outside the gallery, wait, hoping that people who had got the free tickets that we were issuing through the internet, hoping that they wouldn't turn up so that they could get in. And the audience mixture ran from our traditional audiences, people who had been coming to the Whitworth for 20 or 30 years, 
to um, a much more diverse audience from our local community to really young, very trendy, um, kind of live art, music type people who were part of the festival's audience but had not previously been part of the Whitworth's audience. And it was really fantastic to see that span of people. What it also did was set in motion um, a train of thinking and a set of relationships for us at the Whitworth with partners who were based in India. So next step on the journey was to West Africa. And it was not because we decided on India one moment and then thought we'd switch to the African continent for the next year. Rather, and this is one of, I think, the important lessons we've learned, that South Asia and West Africa, if you look at the collections in this city, across the Whitworth, the Manchester Museum, Manchester Art Gallery, and if you look at the history of the city, these are the two trading areas for Manchester. And it's all to do with cotton, really, which is a kind of recurring theme through a lot of our international work. So the collections here have a lot of material from West Africa and even more from South Asia because of Manchester's trading links. So we've learnt that those are really useful areas for us to make international relationships with because they're relevant. They also connect to the communities that now live here. So, in for 2012, as part of the Cultural Olympiad, we really started to think about international partnerships as part of the kind of diversifying of our audiences that we wanted to do because of the kind of city we are. So this is Pascal Martin Tayou creating an internal forest in the Whitworths Gallery. It was part of an exhibition that spanned Manchester Museum, Manchester Art Gallery, the Whitworth, um, the Football Museum, Band on the Wall, uh, outdoor spaces in the city. It involved in the end, 33 artists from 11 countries, none of whom we'd worked with previously. And so it was very, very ambitious and extremely hair-raising to do. But what it brought for us uh, as a result was f funding from trusts and foundations who were extremely interested in us developing relationships with non-First World partners and you know, Mali was descending into almost civil war as we began this project. When colleagues went to Cameroon, it was on the foreign office's list of countries please not, don't visit. There were some really difficult practical barriers in terms of making relationships with these countries, but pressing reasons to want to because of the diversity and strength of the West African communities in Manchester and the long history of relationships between our city and that part of the world. To give you just one example, the, um, the agreement to decolonize Africa, and particularly West Africa, was signed just down the road from here. There's a blue plaque near the art school that note that Kwame Nkrumah, W.E.B. Du Bois and colleagues all gathered here to sign the declaration, um, a commitment towards decolonisation. So it's a really important part of the political history of Manchester. What we learnt from this project is that working together across the city and bringing curators together to go on research visits, to make relationships with partners, partners in West Africa, to build friendships that would eventually result in an exhibition program here was a way of developing something that was much, much bigger than we ever could have imagined. And it seemed like absolutely the right thing to do in the Olympic year where the UK was inviting the world to come together for a big sporting occasion. And even more kind of pertinently, the, the Ghanaian Olympic team was based here in the city. So, Again, we were making actually strategic choices about committing to something that was huge to achieve. The kinds of things that we learned from doing this project are that most of the first world approaches to exhibition touring and exhibition making that we have are not so useful in countries that don't have the same kind of infrastructure. And what that boiled down to was that 
The artworks that came here were mostly sent by artists who used things like DHL and rolling canvases up, in, putting them in tubes and sending them to us. And they arrived perfectly safely. When we sent them back through our proper channels, like Momart, they got stolen in customs. And so we learned that we have to very significantly shift our practice if we're going to be active and positive partners for countries and institutions that don't have the kind of infrastructural support that we have. This is Ai Weiwei and a massive Chinese contemporary art show. Again, chosen and placed here because we have a very significant Chinese community, desire for business links, direct flights now from Manchester, but, and most importantly, I've been working with Hong Kong University and cultural partners in Hong Kong for 10 years now. And so this major exhibition, which was hugely to our benefit, as well as um, to the benefit of the new museum that's being created in Hong Kong that wants international profile, it came out of personal relationships. And that, again, has been one of the abiding lessons for us, that strong international work needs close personal connections if it's to succeed. So where we are now is thinking here in Manchester, and again, not just at the Whitworth, but at Manchester Museum, at Manchester Art Gallery, about 2017, which we will hear more about later, um, and South Asia. Manchester's long-term links with the Indian subcontinent could not be more important or significant to the city. So it's vital that we develop links with partners across those countries. It's also vital because 11% of our local population is drawn from South Asia. And if we wish to connect to those audiences, not that they only want to see South Asian work, but that they do want to see their history reflected in our institutions and feel that we are connected to them in important ways, we really need to build relationships with um, partners across South Asia. So this is a group of people who have just formed themselves to become a network of partners. There are directors of the biennials in Lahore, Karachi, the Dakar Art Summit, the Kochi Biennial, as well as partners from Leeds, Matetli, Liverpool Biennial, and ourselves here. This, for us, will be the next five years of work not doing a one-off project in 2017, but actually exploring the collections here, the art that is emerging from this part of the world, which I regard as one of the most dynamic nodes within the global art world at the moment. But the reason I wanted to finish with a picture of a bunch of people is that the biggest lesson we have learned from building this kind of work is that we need to support our staff, not just directors, but staff at all levels within the organisation, to build networks and friendship across international boundaries if we are to achieve our strategic goals around international profile raising. Because without these personal relationships, it's impossible to organise the kinds of projects we wish to do. And I've got, you see brilliant work, that's my point there. The final slide is myself, Bryony, the director of the Tetley in Leeds, and Mary, one of the curators here, um, encountering multiple near loss of life <laughs> in the back of an auto rickshaw in Dakar. And four days in Dakar taught me that everything we find difficult in these tough economic times that we live in is totally bullshit compared to organizing an art summit in a city like Dakar. It was one of the most humbling and inspiring experiences I have ever been part of. Our willingness to go to Dakar to hold a network meeting fundamentally shifts the balance between north and south. And, and I thought it was quite a good point to end on, that we talk a lot about the kind of cultural rebalancing of the UK. So this national conference is fantastically held here in the north of England. 
But actually, the real rebalancing that the world needs is between the North and the South globally. And that actually museums and galleries are extraordinarily well placed at the moment to be able to achieve that. But it depends on people and relationships. And following that, the funding, in my experience, tends to come. Thank you, everybody. Uh, hello, I'm Ken Arnold from the Wellcome Trust. Um, I, I really enjoyed that talk, and I, I just want to sort of confirm what I thought was the underlying message as you take us through those different projects. So you go from loans and a sort of commercial context to intellectual, sort of academic research, mm -hmm. then on to contemporary art experimentation with some almost accidental social consequences, and then finally these sort of rich relationship-based Mm -hmm. socially motivated projects yeah and I, I i'm just so is it an escalator is there a sense in which you've long since left behind flirting with with japanese money or <laughs> is it a sort of mixed economy where you might surprisingly find uh a bit of what you thought you'd left behind emerging from mm -hmm. from the latter yeah um i think it's very much a mixed economy i mean it's a great question ken because i dropped the the chinese art exhibition in, which was only last year, um, which was fairly straightforward again. M plus is entirely set up to be a, a first world institution, you know, with Lars Nipfro as director and all of that. Um, and so again, beautiful, strategically important for audiences here in Manchester. And I suppose that would be a kind of a side point for me that we haven't, you know, you haven't seen any Latin American projects. You know, it's not so relevant for Manchester, either in terms of the collections or the audiences. So what I imagine as we move forward is that you will get examples of every type of partnership um, happening over time. And that we will, of course, you know, if, if Japanese partners want a mid 20th century modern show, I'm not gonna say no. Um, but that actually we learn more from the, the richer network-based development, and that is m strategically more important. So if I'm looking at um, working with limited resources, I'm going to prioritize giving my staff time to building partnerships which might have 10 or 20 years of benefit here, and that are about growing a knowledge base about the international nature of our collections, the, the global world that we operate in, and actually, fundamentally for me, serving the, the Manchester we now live in, much better.